Get ready for all the craziness of small business. It's exactly that craziness that makes it exciting and totally unbelievable. Small Business Radio is now on the air with your host, Barry Moltz. Well, thanks for joining this week's radio show. Remember, this is the final word in small business. For those keeping track, this is now show number... 575. It is Leap Day 2020. Another day to get unstuck and really show your brilliance to the business world. This episode is provided by Nextiva, the all-in-one communications platform for your small business. It's also sponsored by LinkedIn, the place to generate leads, drive traffic, and build your brand awareness for a free $100 credit to launch your campaign. Go to www.linkedin.com slash SBR. We're also sponsored Sponsored by Vsita, all you need to run your business in one software. Try it for free at www.vcita.com. That's V C I T A.com. And use Barry10 for an exclusive discount. We're all supported by Blue Summit Supplies. Get your W 2s and 1099 tax forms and all your business supplies at www.bluesummitsupplies.com. Use the code SBR10 at checkout to save 10% off your order. Well, my next guest personifies the American dream. He built a company from $3,000 and a credit card to having over a $3 billion valuation. Tom Galassano is an entrepreneur, philanthropist, civic leader, and former owner of the Buffalo Sabres NHL team. He's also the founder and chairman of the board of Paychecks, with more than 15,000 employees and 100 locations nationwide, Paychex is the leading provider of payroll, human resources, and benefits outsourcing for small and medium-sized businesses. Active in both business and philanthropy, Tom currently mentors the entrepreneurs who run businesses in which he has invested and oversees his family's charitable foundation. To date, he's donated over $300 million to a wide range of charitable causes. He's just come out with a great new book. It's called Built Not Born. It's a how-to guide to help entrepreneurs. Tom, welcome to the show. Nice to be here with you this morning. Well, I know you've told the story many times, but please go back for our listeners and tell us, how'd you start a company on $3,000 and a credit card? Well, <clears throat> I was a salesperson and sales manager for a payroll processing firm uh, that specialized in doing payroll processing for larger companies, 100 employees or more. But you drive down any street in the United States, you'll see most businesses have less than 100 employees. In fact, at the library, I found out 98% of all businesses in the U.S. have less than 100 employees. And nobody in the payroll processing business was directing their efforts towards that low end of the market. Uh, so I started a company. Uh, you were right, $3,000 and a couple credit cards. The credit cards lasted about three months before the vendors took them away. <laughs> Couldn't keep up with the payments. Uh, it started out slow. It took me uh, four years to get uh, the first 300 clients. And today, Paychex signs up about 2,000 companies a week, to give you an idea. Right now, we're processing the payroll for 670,000 companies, wow. plus providing human resource services to, to those organizations. So I've had a lot of experience and a lot of background with entrepreneurs. First of all, I love them. I think they're great for this country. I think they're great for America. They're the ones that are the major job creators. And as you work with them, you realize that sometimes they make mistakes, like the mistakes I made. So I wrote the book with the idea that whatever ideas or concepts I could give them to help them be more productive and more efficient, uh, I thought it would be a real good idea. So, Tom, uh, go, when go. I wrote the book, when no, I wrote no. the book, yep. uh, it was real easy for me. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a book publisher on the phone, and while he was talking on the phone to me, I wrote the table of contents, the chapters I wanted to cover. And as you uh, go through the book, you'll see, uh, you know, ones that are very, very important to entrepreneurs. So one of the things I want to go back before we discuss the book is you said that it took you four years to get 300 clients. And I think that's important because a lot of times people look at a success story like yours and they think that it happened overnight, but it really didn't. It didn't. And, you know, that's one of the interesting points about entrepreneurship. Uh, dealing with entrepreneurs, sometimes they get over enthusiastic about their ability to sell customers or, or clients 
and they hang up their shingle or they put up their sign, whatever, and they think the world is going to come to them, and they soon realize that it doesn't work that way, that they're going to go out, have to go out to the world and bring the world to them. And it takes work, it takes hard effort, it takes time, and so forth. But I think that's the biggest, most classic mistake entrepreneurs make. They over-anticipate their ability to sell their product or service. And why do they do that, Tom? Do you think because they're just too optimistic or they're too in love with their service and it's, or if I build it, they will come and people will naturally just buy it? Yeah, I think they get caught up in the enthusiasm and in a way you can't blame them. I mean, starting a business without enthusiasm would probably be a mistake. Right. But they are over-enthusiastic, in my opinion, and they're over they over-project what they're going to be able to sell to their uh, customer base. Right, because somewhere along the line, those customers have probably been getting along almost just fine before you came along. Actually switching to your solution is actually harder than you think. Yes, particularly back when I started in the uh, early 70s, payroll processing for small companies. And today, our average size client has 15 employees. Right. So that tells you or defines for a small payroll processing wasn't even thought of for that market at that time. So we were kind of new to the market. We did some things that made our product a little more favorable uh, to small companies. And obviously it, it worked over a long period of time. I think one of the most difficult things when you start out is to get other companies to trust you. And I'm thinking, how do you get these companies to trust you to do their payroll, which is probably one of the most sensitive things they have? Well, I'd like to say it was my smart sales ability and so forth. But you, it took us a while because people were reticent. You know, handling a company's payroll is a very personal thing, especially in a small business. Uh, the owner is usually very concerned about confidentiality. And doesn't want the word to get out in the street that what his payroll is all about. So they are we're at reticent. But today it's a lot different story, Barry. Most companies that start up now think about payroll processing. But I'm going to give you an interesting statistic. With all the payroll processors combined in the United States today, and there are a lot of them, we only have combined 20% of the potential marketplace. Wow. So there's room for growth for all the payroll processes, obviously, including paychecks. Wow. That's crazy to me because I always, the advice I always give the small business owners, as soon as you get your first employee, you've got to outsource your payroll, right? Because maybe because I made that mistake in my business where I didn't, and the IRS shut me down because I didn't remit the payroll taxes or what I collected from my employees on time. That's the funny thing about that, Tom. They get upset about that. <laughs> yes, they do. You know, and it, it, the burden is, is uh, big, too, for a, an employer. For example, if you have the five employees in the state of New York, you have a minimum of 52 payroll tax returns and payments that must be made on a timely and correct basis. And if you don't do it correctly and timely, the fines are pretty severe. So wow. relying on a payroll service like Paychex is is it really a good move for a new entrepreneur? So another thing that new entrepreneurs face, Tom, is to try to figure out how much money they need to run their business. And I remember in the early 2000s, when I was an angel investor, a guy pitched to me and said, well, to get started, I only need a million dollars. And I'm thinking, yeah, I only need a million dollars too. But how do you figure out actually the amount of capital that you do need to start your business? Well, it's not an easy thing. And of course, you have to go through the process of doing sales projections. And the amount of sales revenue you bring in is going to be the biggest indicator of how much capital you're going to need. And because entrepreneurs have a tendency to over-enthusiastically speculate what their revenue is going to be, and it doesn't happen, then they end up with in what they call a cash flow problem. But it's really a sales problem. Having industry experience before an entrepreneur opens up their business uh, – is a very important thing, I believe. I was fortunate enough, I worked for a payroll processor, maybe directed its services to a different market that I went after, but having that industry knowledge for any entrepreneur is very, very important. So, Tom, how do you figure out the right amount? Because I've always said that sometimes entrepreneurs raise too much money, and too much money gets them to be lazy and stupid. How do you make sure you don't waste it? <laughs> well... A lot of times that depends on the source of the money. If it's your own money, 
you may have a tendency to be a lot more careful. At, at, right. Uh, <laughs> well, you should be more careful with other people's money. That's exactly right. OPM. Right, OPM. Uh, but uh, I'm sort of an investor myself in a number of businesses, and that's always a $64 question. How much money do they really need, and where is it going to come from? It's it's probably the biggest area of concern for any entrepreneur. And, and so how do you help them through that? Do you help them through what the cash flow is going to look like a year or two years from now? Well, the way you help them through is to sit down with them and look at their projections and make sure they're realistic. Um, for example, in the case when I started Paychex, I knew how much revenue was going to come in from each customer. I had an idea of how many customers I could sell a week, a month, or a year. Then I took that revenue and multiplied it by the number of customers. And then I took a look at what my overhead was. And, that, for example, if a customer brought in $15 a pay period every week, and I had 100 of them, that would be $1,500 a week. Now, what is my overhead to service those customers? And that's pretty easy to determine. I know I probably have, they have two or three employees and the cost of, prep, of processing and so on and so forth. So it's pretty easy to do. And I think any entrepreneur that goes into a business should have a real good idea of what it takes to make a profit, starting with the sales volume and comparing it to their expenses. I think any entrepreneur starting a business can put that on one piece of paper, one page of a business plan should be, how many clients do I need? What's gonna be my profit margin per client? And how much capital do I need to get to that point? So one of the things as you're giving someone capital, you've got to negotiate what the equity deal is going to be. And I know that the philosophy for your company is a good deal for everyone. Tell us about that. What does it mean, a good deal for everyone? Is that possible? I think it's very possible. Uh, and I think it's also a quality way to operate uh, a venture. The people around you, the people you associate with, if they're not doing, or if they're not getting a decent deal from you for whatever the service might be or equity in the company, uh, they're not going to stay with you. So I really believe that uh, making deals that are good for everybody is very important. Now, let me tell you how Paychex became a national company. And this might help explain this question. After I got started in Rochester, New York, and had those 300 clients, I started got, getting individuals involved. Um, in setting up payroll offices, paychecks offices, in different cities around the country. As a matter of fact, in a four-year period, I brought in 17 more people, 17 different people that all basically lived in Rochester, New York, and moved to various parts of the country and started a paychecks operation. Did that for a number of years, uh, four or five years, and then we decided we would form one company. We would band together these 17 organizations. We would all become employees and shareholders. We had a five-year plan to uh, open offices and develop our sales force for the first three years, focus on profitability the next two years, and then eventually sell the company or take it public. Now, when I convinced or made the sales pitch to these people to consolidate it into one company, I was trying to make a good deal for everyone. Now, you mentioned we have a market capitalization of the company of $31 billion today. The smallest shareholder of the new organization owned 1.5%. Now, you can multiply 1.5% times $31 billion. That's a lot of money. A very sizable dollar amount. So it ended up being a great deal for everyone. And that's sort of the basic philosophy when I get involved with an entrepreneur or entrepreneurs. How is this going to be good for everybody? I really like that because I think that in the world today, in politics, in current events, it always seems like you win, I lose, right? And I think that you in business, if everyone can come out ahead, everyone's happier for it, and you have a greater chance of success. The only place you win and somebody else loses is in politics. <laughs> right. Or sports. <laughs> or sports, right? Or sports. 
Absolutely. Yeah, of course, at least you can come back next year. Exactly. Let me ask you one last question. One of the things that has always puzzled me is, how do you train a entrepreneur to become a good leader and a manager? Because I was fortunate enough, Tom, that when I started my career for the first 10 years, I worked for IBM. They promoted me to a manager. They sent me away to charm school for a month, and I got a lot of experience in training and to be a manager, but most entrepreneurs don't. They don't know how to really delegate and lead. What advice do you have them for? Or that? Well, there's some basic principles of that, and it's going to sound so basic, uh, people will probably scratch their head and say, is that right? Here it is. Treat people the way you want to be treated. That's the number one goal of good leadership. Honesty and integrity. And treat people the way you would like to be treated, and then they will follow you. Now, I believe if you're an entrepreneur with a certain skill level, let's say you're a three. With work, with experience, you could become a six or a seven, or maybe a six could become a nine. Um, so everybody has the opportunity, especially in including employees of small companies, to become more entrepreneurial than they are. I like that a lot. It's trying to improve what you have. Well, the title of the book is called Built Not Born, People can get it at Amazon. But, Tom, if they want to learn more about your journey, where can they reach you? Um, yeah, there's Co a website. Called that, Tom, uh, Tom Golisano? Yes. TomGolisano.com. Okay. It's T-O-M-G-O-L-I-S-A-N-O.com. Tom, thanks so right, much for sir. being on the show, and thanks for everything you do to help out entrepreneurs. It was a pleasure. Thank you much. This is AMA 20 WCPT in Chicago. We'll be right back. Time and place is everything, especially when it comes to marketing. But in today's age of a million messages per minute and not enough hours in a day, how do you really catch people's attention? Fortunately, there's a simple way. LinkedIn can help you speak to the right professionals at the right time. With over 62 million decision makers on LinkedIn, you're able to connect with the right business leaders who are relevant to your company. And with LinkedIn ads, you can make sure your messages are getting through to these relevant people. Even small businesses are making the most of LinkedIn ads. They're using LinkedIn to get their voices heard and their messages to resonate with the audience. It's not just about awareness either. LinkedIn ads are driving traffic and engagement, whether that's visits to a landing page, registration to an event, or downloads of that thought leadership piece. Because with precise targeting, small businesses can speak to the people that matter the most. At the end of the day, LinkedIn ads are helping smaller businesses get big results. Try it for yourself. LinkedIn is offering a free $100 LinkedIn ad credit to launch your first campaign. Simply go to www.linkedin.com slash SBR. That's www.linkedin.com slash SBR to claim your free $100 ad credit. Terms and conditions apply. You've already upgraded your cell phone to a smart device, which lets you use the internet to be more productive on the go. But what about your desk phone? Nextiva. Nextiva is a smart business phone system in the cloud. With a simple setup through an internet connection, you can soon have access to your office communications wherever you are. Stay seamlessly connected with clients and stay more mobile than ever before with just one low monthly cost. Give your business more than just a basic desk phone. Visit nextiva.com or call 800-799-0600 to learn more today. Nextiva. Nextiva. Simplifying your business communications. Are you stuck? Is this the year you finally grow your business and make more money? During Barry's many years of running his own company, he had to deal with the challenges of a business that just wasn't going anywhere. It was a painful realization. His business had flatlined, and he had no idea how to breathe more life into it. It was especially difficult for Barry, since his customers were not getting the service he was so passionate about delivering. Second, he wasn't making any money. Finally, his business was sucking the life out of him. Do any of these sound familiar? Your sales won't budge in spite of your best efforts. You have few new leads for customers coming in, and existing customers are fading away. You're burned out and completely exhausted. It's no longer fun, and your family suffers as well. If you're one of the millions of small business owners facing these problems every year, Barry has the answer. Check out barrymoltz.com slash unstuck to subscribe to his six-part video series. That's barrymoltz, M-O-L-T-Z dot com slash unstuck. 
Stick around to get your small business unstuck. More of Small Business Radio with Barry Moles. Now on WCPT 820, Chicago's Progressive Talk. Well, there's a lot of discussion recently about how behavioral science can be used in business. Here to help is Charlotte Blank, who's the chief behavioral officer at Moritz. She leads the company's practice of behavioral science innovation through expert applications of social psychology and behavioral economics. And Senate Magazine named Charlotte a visionary and one of the 2016's 25 most influential in the incentive industry. Charlotte, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Barry. Happy to be here. Well, I introduced you with a mouthful. What is behavioral science? So we can all understand. Behavioral science is sort of an umbrella term to catch um, uh, studies like social psychology and behavioral economics, um, ways of thinking about how people really make decisions. um, And those include some interesting sort of subconscious and environmental factors uh, that influence the the way we make decisions or decide how to focus our energy and resources. Um, Not all of our decisions are perfectly rational or aligned with economic theory in the traditional sense. Oh, you don't say they're not all perfectly rational? (laughs) Of course, very much. So what is Maritz doing in this area? Why are they so interested in being an incentive firm? So Maritz does actually have kind of a broad portfolio of business solutions, but broadly speaking, we're a people and performance company. We help to understand, enable, and motivate people to really unleash their potential. Um, We work with large companies in all industries and essentially um, bring out the best in their stakeholders, be they salespeople, sales partners like uh, distributors and wholesalers, dealerships and the like, uh, as well as consumers. So there's many ways to do that. Some of the traditional ways where Merit's really started over 100 years ago is this whole field of incentive, recognition, and reward, these extrinsic levers that we can pull to influence people and sort of offer carrots and sticks. Um, But there's a lot of nuance and subtlety to this as well. Um, So there's a a whole practice of of professional services, consulting, um, that uh, uh, that go to support that technology and rewards practice. Uh, but really at the core of all of it is an understanding of human behavior. So um, if our job is to help you as a corporation get the most out of your people, then the way we do that is by investing in a deep understanding of what makes those people tick so, and how we can apply those learnings from from uh, academia into industry. So if I'm a small business owner, how do I really design a system so the people do strive their best to achieve the goals that we've mutually agreed upon? Is it all about money? Yeah, not even close. Yeah, so um, so we, we tend to think, you know, traditional economic theory, if we were to think that, you know, people were rational economic utility maximizing calculators, um, then this would all be really easy, that we would just, you know, sort of assume a straight line that the more money you offer someone, the harder they work, and the more you get out of them. Um, and you wouldn't need this whole sort of study around what actually makes people work. Um, But we know from psychology that things are much more complex than that. Money is important. You know, people need to earn a fair living. Um, You know, no one's suggesting that we just kind of throw out cash compensation as a foundation of our kind of salary system. But when it comes to what we do at Merits and sort of um, we work with people to find that extra 10%, that sort of extra lift or oomph and helping people to find that discretionary effort and go beyond the nine to five, um, that's where cash can have sort of a diminishing return um, and start to feel like just more of the same and is less special than some of the other um, non-traditional, non-cash reward mechanisms we might look at. Charlotte, I love the idea that you say, how do you get the extra 10% or the discretionary effort? Because I really think that's what it's about. That's what is going to separate your team and your employees uh, off from the next small business owners. And you say, it's really not about money. It'd be easier if it was about money. What kinds of things should I have in my company so I can get that extra little bit that's going to put me ahead of the competition? Well, I think stepping outside of the whole space of incentives and reward is starting first by thinking about intrinsic motivation. There's a whole body of scientific research on based on self-determination theory that suggests that we find our greatest uh, sort of motivation from within, um, from an intrinsic desire to be our best. So I would start as a manager or a leader of a small business by looking at the culture of the organization and the systems I've designed. Um, throughout the company to help enable 
this intrinsic motivation through levers like giving people a sense of autonomy or control or choice. Um, giving them a sense of purpose, like they're connected to something greater than the work they do, um, be that a greater societal good or really just a, a clear connection to the company's bottom line. Um, and also social connections. You know, humans are an incredibly social species and we're at work for so uh, such a large portion of our day um, that if we feel that we have strong connections with our peers um, as a social system at work, that can go a long way as well. So those are a few kind of areas that I would focus on before even thinking about um, issues like compensation and extrinsic incentives, which can be a nice sort of juice to get people, you know, focused on a goal. If you have a really um, high priority sales item, for example, in a particular month, that can be great for focusing attention. Um, but if there's room to be gained on the intrinsic motivation side, I think you get more bang from your buck kind of starting there. Cheryl, I totally agree with you, and I love the three things you listed out, and they really bear repeating. One is, you know, autonomy and choice in their job, a sense of purpose in what they're doing, and then social connections. And I think most of these are very difficult for a small business owner to execute on as a leader, because many times I go into small business owners, uh, companies, and they haven't really define what is the greater purpose of what we're doing. Right? I know that we make widgets, but... What are we really doing? Just like when you see on like the side of the waste management truck, right? We create landfills, or on the side of the uh, Commonwealth Edison electrical truck, it says we create warm homes. What's the what's really the purpose? They've really got to create that so we can all get behind something, right? Hmm. Indeed. Yeah. There's some really cool research that suggests once you've got kind of a vision for what that purpose is, that the way you explain that, the way the language you choose to frame up that vision, is important as well. So there's some early research on the difference between image-based words and abstract words. And I know you talk to a lot of business folks and you probably hear a lot of really generic kind of buzz terms from the leadership um, lexicon like synergies and innovations and we are going to make a difference and community and things that could really apply to any company and aren't very specific. Um, and so this research suggests that if you can paint a picture, um, like a great sort of the iconic example is JFK's speech, we're going to put a man on the moon and really something that people can picture in their minds, um, that that can be not only clearer, but more motivating and get people sort of collaborating toward the same goal that they can experience through a sense of shared cognition. Right, because people really, especially at work or whatever they spend a lot of time doing, they want to be part of something that is greater than themselves, right? Mm-hmm, indeed. That, that's definitely a human condition. The other part, I think it is difficult to small business owners. You say they need to have a sense of autonomy and choice. And I think a lot of owners say, I want them to do exactly what I tell them to do, exactly when I told them to do it, that they don't want to give people autonomy and choice. But why is that so important? Um, so, I, I think there's lots of ways to do it, you know, by the way, that it's um, it can be that we can find ways to frame up choice opportunities in uh, surprising ways, like one of my favorite areas is called um, job crafting, where we let people sort of reframe how they think about their role. Some of that research suggests that people who might have a job that one might consider sort of menial tasks, like cleaning the hallways, for example, in a hospital setting, if they are encouraged to think about that kind of connection to the, the purpose again and reframe that role as like, my job is keeping this environment safe and sterile and clean, um, which is a, an important part of the healing process for these patients. And so maybe even allowing them to kind of uh, create a title that reflects that versus, um, let's say, custodian in the traditional sense. That would be like an example of a creative way that you could give people autonomy in a way of thinking about their job. Um, that isn't so isn't really so difficult from a management perspective. You also talk about another key lever is social connections. And I think, again, a lot of small business owners don't want to see people socializing because they want to see them working. But we have to really understand that if people can get close to each other, they will go the extra mile for each other sometimes more than they'll go for the company. Yeah, and you know, I, I don't think that um, that having a social connection with people is mutually exclusive from, you know, giving your all and focusing on your work. In fact, I think they really go hand in hand. Our chairman, Steve Meritz, has a uh, sort of phrase that, that we use as our kind of corporate values, which are work hard, have fun, get the job done. 
And he's purposeful about framing it that way, which is different from work hard, play hard, which suggests that there's like a separation from work and, you know, there's work time and then there's fun time. Because the way he thinks about fun is that hard work is a part of it and that our most positive memories with people are not times where, you know, the sun was in your face and everything was lovely. It was times when, you know, things were tough and you worked together to solve a tough challenge. That's Those are the memories that we take forward with us and make us think fondly upon our, our social connections. So to him, and I think to us as a company culture, working hard is part of the fun that we have together. And that can all be part of creating a meaningful social experience. So what kinds of, from your experience, Charlotte, let's say we're working on a special project, what kind of rewards are best to roll out inside of a company that will really make people feel good about what they achieved? Because that's part of it. I think too many times we don't pause to celebrate if we achieve something great. So there's lots of ways to think about rewards. Um, you know, one way to start could be the intrinsic and extrinsic um, components we discussed earlier. So um, just sort of recognition, just saying, I see what you did um, and I appreciate you is a really valuable form of reward, having that sense of recognition from a manager and also from peers. Um, and then when we talk about extrinsic rewards, again, that's more about focusing effort on some discretionary kind of above and beyond extra 10% kind of situation in the sales landscape where we're heavily involved. You might um, use the term SPIF or short-term incentive. <laughs> um, so if we want people to really gather around, uh, rally around something important, then extrinsic motivators can be super um, motivating. And we, you know, talked about cash, but there's something about the human brain that we do called um, mental accounting where, you know, if we lump all, if we have, people are already being paid a cash salary and then you give them another cash bonus on top of it, that feels good enough, but it kind of feels quite familiar and similar and can create this sort of drop in the bucket effect. Um, whereas if you were to offer instead the chance to be part of a top performer trip, for example, like a really incredible um, meeting or travel experience um, in, an, in a destination, for example, that feels like something distinct and special and separate and and really worth um, going for. And science suggests that um, that sense of separation or separate mental accounting actually makes people value that potential reward um, more highly. Well, now that I have someone from the incentive industry on the, uh, on the radio show, I want to know what does the word SPIF actually, what's the abbreviation for that? Because I haven't heard that in so long. We used to use the word, yeah, the word SPIF <laughs> at IBM. Yeah, I uh, I don't remember. Special either. something, right? Special performance incentive. I didn't ever know what the F stood for, so I guess I'm still searching. One of the other things you mentioned is that a good way to recognize people is just to simply say, "I see what you did. I see you there." And it's funny because I'm a big Peloton trainer. It's like spinning on a bicycle. And one of the trainers, she's always calling about people, and she says specifically, "I see you there. I see you there." And a lot of people, they, if they do a great job, they just want to be recognized for doing that great job. And it could be as simply as, I see you there. Yeah. And what's amazing about that is that intrinsic desire for recognition um, is just as effective when it's anonymous. So there's a really cool research by one of our partners, Yana Gallas at UCLA, who did this study with Wikipedians, people who contribute to the Wikipedia website. And as you probably know, they do all of this work for free. Right. This is a community of people who are intrinsically motivated. They just want to contribute their knowledge to um, the collective. And in her study, she randomly assigned some people an award that she just made up that was just like a little badge that says, you know, great job, con contr contributor award. She named it the Edelweiss Award. But um, found that those who were given this sort of status badge even though they write under anonymous monikers, they're sort of ghostwriters, no one knows who they are, but those who got that badge um, ended up contributing more and lasting with the site longer than did similar contributors who didn't get the badge. So it works even when people can't really see or who you are. Yeah, it's interesting to me because you see on a lot of these sites now, like I contribute a lot to TripAdvisor where you get different kind of badges. 
mm. right? Or if you're a top contributor on Facebook, right, you'll get a badge for that particular site. So it's really very interesting. I think it's a really important subject, Charlotte. Where can people learn more about uh, what you and the organization are doing? Um, I would check out peoplescience.com, which is really just a fun website. It's uh, run by a science writer who's also a stand-up comedian. So Wow, um, that sounds really, like fun. It's super fun and funny, and it's designed to kind of make people as excited about behavioral science as we are so that we can kind of continue to grow this momentum in applying the work and really connecting the science to the real world. peoplescience.com. Charlotte, thanks so much for being on the show. This is AM820 WCPT in Chicago. We'll be right back. Tune in regularly to my show. Then you know that I talk to many different businesses across the country, different types of people, different backgrounds, all kinds of industries. But there's one thing that unites all of us, searching that thing known as work-life balance. I get pretty bummed out when a listener tells me that they haven't been home for dinner in a whole month. That's why I'm so excited to introduce you to Visita. Visita does a lot for one little application. It can help you achieve that lifestyle. Visita is that personal assistant on steroids you never had. It syncs your client information, appointments, and payments. Visita sends automated appointments and payment reminders, making sure your clients keep appointments and get paid on time. Visita understands today's consumer, making it easy for them to book an appointment and pay from literally anywhere. A website, Facebook, emails, even your Google My Business profile. It's also compatible with Google, Gmail, iCal, social media, and Square Payments. So get your free 14-day trial during which you can explore every single feature. Go to vcita.com. That's V-C-I-T-A dot com. No credit card required. No strings attached. No brainer. And when you're ready to buy, use promo code BARRY10 to get 10% off. With Barry's 25 years in small business, he has finally discovered the magic formula to make more profit at any company. Business gurus make it seem so complicated, but it is really simple. The formula is P times P equals P, where people multiplied by process means more profit. Learn how you can take a quantum leap in just 180 days to grow the profit in your business. Contact Barry at Maltz.com. Tax season is here, and now it's time to file. Blue Summit Supplies has what you need to make filing your 1099s and W-2s quicker, cheaper, and easier than ever. Reduce the stress of tax season by stocking up on IRS-compliant tax forms for your 1099s, W-2s, plus learn how you can save time and money by filing your 2019 taxes online using their simple, safe, and secure electronic filing service. Enjoy free expedited shipping on every order within the continental U.S. Learn more at www.bluesummitsupplies.com slash SBR and use the code SBR10 at checkout to save 10% on your order for any paper, tax forms, and envelopes. Stick around to get your small business unstuck. More of Small Business Radio with Barry Moles now on WCPT 820, Chicago's Progressive Talk. Well, I've told this story before, but in 1995, I woke up with blurry vision. The next day, it got worse, so I went to my doctor because I thought that I was going blind. After a series of tests, he told me that I had diabetes, but I thought, how could this be? I was 35, not overweight. I was in good shape. There was no history of diabetes in my family. I had a really hard time accepting this news. I immediately plunged into depression, anxiety, and lost a third of my body weight in an attempt to control my blood sugar. Needless to say, it was really a nightmare. But my next guest, David Weingard, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 36 while training for a survival race. As an avid athlete, David committed to rebuilding his life and providing positive energy to the diabetes community coping with this condition. David helped found through a certified diabetes educator named Cecilia. His experience receiving meaningful education and support from her sparked the idea for Cecilia Help to leverage technology to scale the patient's reach of adherence, outcome improvement programs for pharmaceutical payer and provider organizations. David, welcome to the show. 
Uh, Barry, thank you for sharing your story, and a pleasure to be here. Great to have you here. So talk about the diabetes crisis that's really going on in this country, because it's getting worse. Yeah, it really is, and it's important for the listeners to know that there's two types of diabetes. There's type 1, uh, where the body stops creating insulin, and type 2, where uh, there's a lack of regulation of that insulin. If you're type 1, you're, it's of the 32 million in the U.S., it's about 2 million of those, and type 2 is the majority. And you hear, when you're on the news, diabetes, it's typically talking about type 2 diabetes, where with some medication and some exercise and nutrition, you can keep it under control and avoid the complications from the disease, the heart, your heart disease, uh, neuropathy, we lose feeling in the arms and legs, blindness, and other really serious complications. So we really are in a state of crisis because there's now a trend toward one in three Americans having diabetes within 10 years. Wow. And most people are very overwhelmed. They, they need help. Yeah. And, and I think the hard part is, I guess I feel, you know, when I was diagnosed, I was fortunate because I had symptoms where I thought I was going blind. I had blurry vision because my blood sugar was too high. But a lot of people, they call it the silent killer because they really don't know that anything's going on until either they have a blood test or something really tragic or reversible happens to them. Yeah, absolutely. With type 1, the... the um side effects that you had with your revision, weight loss, really kind of drive people to get to the hospital. So you have to get on insulin or you basically die, right? So it's it's a life or death uh, scenario. With type 2, it is progressive, and people have to go see their providers and get their lab tests. And if they think they have diabetes or their doctor has said, you know, you you have diabetes in your family, you need to be careful, it's that much more important to go get tested regularly. And it's just an annual blood test part of the regular labs the doctor would do. And they look at your blood sugar levels and determine if they're getting, uh, if they're going higher. And then again, by catching it early and uh, working, you know, on weight management and exercise and nutrition especially, uh, really can avoid medication. And if you have to go on medication, it's okay. We just have to take it. And a lot of the serious complications with diabetes can be avoided. You know, it's really funny. Some of my people say to me, some of my friends say to me, I don't understand how you stick like five times a day, you stick a needle into your stomach. How could you do that? And I'm like, well, do you want to live? <laughs> right? Do you want to survive? Right. You'll do that. But David, tell us about your journey. You're, you're training for this survival race. Tell us about it and what happened to you and how you came to this realization that you had diabetes and what happened to you immediately after that with this certified diabetes educator, Cecilia. Yeah, so I was training for this uh, eight-stage survival race, running, swimming, biking, uh, more of a like an expanded triathlon, and I just had lost 30 pounds. I didn't even realize it. I just put on some shorts uh, on the way to the doctor's office, and they were huge. I didn't even understand it. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because diabetes, when it's not controlled, affects the, m- the mind as well. I mean, I, I look back and I say, how could I not realize I was 30 pounds lighter than my average weight. And, you know, thankfully there is insulin nowadays. And once I got on insulin, I started to get my weight back and started to rebuild my life and do marathons and Ironman triathlons again uh, for di- raising money for diabetes and got involved in the diabetes community. What really made a huge difference for me was um, a lady named Cecilia, a nurse who was a diabetes educator, who gave me the education and support and compassion that I needed to live that empowered life with diabetes. And I really, uh, she was my inspiration for founding this company because at the time I was working at Microsoft and it was all about technology. And I said, this doesn't make any sense. There's only 30,000 Cecilia's in this country. There's only 3,000 endocrinologists. Why, how are we gonna really scale and reach, you know, the 32 million people with diabetes if we're not using technology to scale them? And that's really when the company, started about 10 years ago, and we've been innovating, creating big change, uh, and helping people around the country ever since. So what goes through your mind that you're you're an executive at Microsoft, and now you're going to leave Microsoft and start something totally new that no one's ever done before? What does that decision-making process look like, and what did your family and friends tell you about that? Well, 
fortunately, I had a, a supportive family and I had three young kids. So I made sure we signed our first client, which was Bayer, Bayer, Bayer Diabetes back then. Uh, but, you know, it's like almost when, to me, it's like starting a triathlon race where you kind of have your wetsuit on and you jump in the water. It's like you just got to go. And I just like there was no there was there was no way I was not going to pursue this because people need help. And um, I just saw it wasn't about money. It was about giving back. I mean, this this country, I, you know, is great. And people every day are diagnosed and they're overwhelmed. Fifty percent of the patients, you know, they're not taking their medication. They don't understand what the doctor told them. Uh, they're in denial. Diabetes is a job no one wants. And the only way to really engage them is to, is to have, you know, a Cecilia person, you know, virtually, you know, fit into their schedule and their world and their language and their socioeconomic group, engage with them and help teach them and do that in a way that really makes a difference in their life. And I, I just had to do it. I think that what you mentioned is so true because I found that when I first found out, you know, uh, the doctor told me he sat me in a room and I, he gave me this very complicated medical textbook. And basically what it said was all the horrible things are going to happen to me over the next 20 years. And it does get really lonely. You got to monitor the food that go in your mouth. You got to start taking daily medication. You got to think about it. And, and I think that having someone to share that journey with you, whether it be a person or, you know, in, in this new case, really an AI, that really helps. Tell us about how Cecilia helps people with diabetes. Yeah, absolutely. So everyone's different. And what we found is we need to engage in a human way first. With We always have the same clinical expert, uh, diabetes educator with the patient, engaging, building trust, finding out what's going on in their life. Are they taking their medication? What barriers, what challenges are they having? And then over the engagement, where we will start to teach them how to use technology, like how to test their blood sugar, how to use continuous glucose monitoring devices, which give real-time data so that we can see how they're doing, to discuss the changes in blood sugar as it relates to the, uh, to the food they ate or their lifestyle, or help them make healthy choices. So our, our clients are either pharmaceutical, medical device companies who want their patients to stay on their medication and persist, for the doctor's uh, care plan or health plans that want us to engage with the patients in order to get them healthier and, uh, you know, lower the cost. We want to keep patients out of the hospital. We want to keep them as healthy as possible. And we need to do that in a way that's compassionate. We need to make it very personalized so it fits into their schedule, on their language, in their culture. Um, and that's, that's really what we're doing. We're really a digital health company. And we optimize the human and electronic touch to get patients to a really good point. So what does the electronic touch, David, look like for someone that's, you know, uh, using your service? So as we engage with a patient uh, and where we got to a certain point, they may say, you know what, I just have questions from time to time. And so we have one way into a text messaging. We'll use email. We'll send them links to videos that are very personalized to them. If they're dealing with, uh, you know, getting on a weight management program, they may be links to helpful content uh, that's around that. Also now with continuous glucose monitors and, of course, blood glucose meters, which help pull the, the numbers, the diabetes numbers, the amount of sugar in the blood, that data can be uh, collected by us through the cloud. And we're able to look at the patterns that the patient is having and then engage with the patient on a much richer level. Because it's one thing to have a conversation with somebody and say, you know, I'm trying to lose weight and this and help them through that. But it's another thing to have that same conversation while looking at the patterns of their blood sugar over the week and discussing the meals or how it came down after they went for a walk in the evening. And that helps motivate the patient. So being able to, A, communicate with the patient digitally so that it fits into their schedule and the way they like to be communicated with, and B, taking data in about how things are going with them and monitoring them, and then engaging with them with a much more richer conversation are key parts of our digital strategy. 
You know, it's interesting with the data because with the data, as you said, you can have a much more rich conversation because think about what these conversations were before. Someone had a you know bad blood sugar readings or they had a bad A1C, which really says after three months, you know, how you're really taking care of yourself. If you don't have any of the data, what does the diabetes educator or the doctor say? You should eat better. You should do this. But if you have all the data continuously about how the blood sugar is going up and down, that makes it a much more richer experience, and then the individuals, David, can really practice their own self-care. And I found with diabetes, self-care is really what it's all about. It's not up to my doctor. It's not up to anybody else. I've really got to take responsibility for it, and I think it's different when you're 35 or 45 or 55 years old than when you're 5 or 15 or 25 to take responsibility for it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, diabetes, at the end of the day, you have to self-manage the disease. The physicians, you know, they have maybe 10 minutes with you, 15 minutes with you when you come in. And that's enough to kind of check on the meds, but not enough to really do the behavioral conversation that you need to really understand what you need to do with all these devices and meds. When you go out there, I mean, insulin is a very powerful drug. You know, it, it, moder- it, it improves the blood sugars. But it's also very complicated. You know, have to carbohydrate count and take the right dosage. You can go low if you're throughout the day, if you take too much or you exercise or walk while you have a lot of insulin. And so it's really something that we have to get people to be able to self-manage and be empowered in their lives. Well, David, I appreciate you working on this adventure. It's so important for the millions and millions of people like us who have diabetes. Where can people learn more about Cecilia and your adventure? Yeah, please come and join the Cecilia Cecilia Health community, uh, CeciliaHealth.com, which is spelled C-E-C-E-L-I-A, health.com. We also have a very active LinkedIn community and Facebook community, and you can always post questions there, and our clinicians will be able to help. So uh, wishing everybody a very empowered life with diabetes. David, thanks so much for joining us, and thank everyone for joining us for this week's radio show. I want to thank our sponsors, Nextiva, the all-in-one communications platform for your small business. I want to thank LinkedIn. It's the place to generate leads, drive traffic, and build your brand awareness. For a free $100 credit to launch your campaign, go to www.linkedin.com slash SBR. We're also sponsored by Vsita, all you need to run your business in one software. Try for free at www.vcita.com. That's V-C-I-T-A.com. Use the code Barry10 for an exclusive discount. And finally, we're supported by Blue Summit Supplies. Get your W-2s, 1099 tax forms, and all your business supplies at www.bluesummitsupplies/sbr and use the code SBR10 at checkout to save 10% off your order. I want to thank our incredible staff, our booking producer, Sarah Shaffron, our in-studio producer today is Devin, our marketing manager, Courtney Gilchrist. If you're serious about being more successful here in 2020, you got to give me a call. My phone line is 773-837-8250 or just email me at barry at moltz.com. Remember, love everyone, trust a few, and paddle your own canoe. Have a profitable and passionate week. You can find Barry Moltz on the web at barrymoltz.com or more episodes of Small Business Radio at smallbizradioshow.com.